Welcome yet again to the fifth annual CCM Engineering Shark Tank. It's a pleasure to have you. Your input so far has really been phenomenal. <coughs> it's really mission critical for us to get feedback from the audience so that in the future we will thrive, we will grow not only technically, socially, but also from a communication standpoint, and that's a big deal for us. <laughs> CNN analysis reports that uh, property passengers, like uh, passengers for property on an airline, they lose $2.5 million, and that's just within the four years, 2010 to 2014. Now, the current, the total value of reported stolen property is in the 12 billion range, and that's only within the one year by the FBI, since 2015. So it's a big problem, and that's why we came up with uh, Grand Guard and our product, because we believe that society, nothing should be, everything should be protected and be secure. So, since everything needs to be protected, we came up with uh, Grab Guard. We see that there's a problem, and through technology, we can solve that problem. So, we say that we have, a, let's say you have your bag, and you have your wallet, your phone, you have all your personal information in there. That could be stolen, so that's identity theft. So, you have a real reason to have, want to have your stuff protected. So that's what we mainly came up with Grab Guard for. And uh, through a lot of research and uh, brainstorming, we came up with our product. We realized that it needed to, we needed to come up with something to stop theft and uh, make society better, basically. So we came up with um, a couple of uh, solutions through technology, and uh, that's what we have Grab Guard for. So I'm going to present the product, and uh, just one second, we'll, you'll see what we do. So say you're just at the library, your bag is sitting on the table, someone tries to steal it, you lift it up, it alerts you, you know that your, uh, your bag is being tampered with, uh, the theft will run, the person will run away, who knows what happened. And we, uh, with the mobile app that Lewis was talking about, we uh, want to have, like, you know, uh, uh, communication. Yeah, communication between the device and like, the user. And uh, to go into more technical detail, I'm just going to hand this off to Jeff. Mm -hmm. Jeff over here. Switch spots. Yeah. Grab Guard utilizes many different electronic peripherals to achieve belonging secure. Let's take a look deeper into the different technologies used. GPS. The Grab Guard has a GPS, which is providing us with a lot of data. That data consists of UTC time data, latitude, longitude, and altitude, satellite positioning, and speed. The Grab Guard is currently only taking advantage of the speed data that we're collecting from the GPS, and we're using that to determine if the bag or Grab Guard is in motion or not. Wireless data transfer. The Grab Guard has a GSM cellular chip installed into it, which allows us to communicate with the user via SMS, or more commonly known as text messaging. The reason we decided to go with GMS is because it's a global protocol that allows us to use the product overseas with just different carriers that are more, familiar, more common in overseas markets. As we all know, cell service is extremely expensive, and because GrabGuard hinges upon the use of cell service, we spent a lot of time and energy looking into different carriers to team up with our product. We ended up landing on Ting, which has a very unconventional product pricing or service structure, 
where you're only paying for the amount of data, or in our case, text that you use. So as an example, you're paying three cents per text, and if you were notified eight times in a month of bad activity that's been moved or stolen, you're only paying 24 cents for that month. Another thing that we incorporated into the grab guard is Bluetooth, which allows us to communicate with the user even when we're in cellular dead zones, which are common. Um, the Bluetooth has roughly a 30 foot um, range, plus or minus. Now in a room this size, because it's so large and open, you're gonna be getting more like 100 feet of communication line of sight, but it's extremely dependent on where you're actually at. I am you. The grab guard has a gyroscope and accelerometer installed into it, which are both inertial measurement units. We're taking the data that we're getting from the accelerometer and gyroscope, and we're cross-referencing it with the speed data that we're collecting from the GPS. Um, we're using this to create a much more vivid image of what the status of grab guard is. So as an example, because the speed data from the GPS is accurate plus or minus a foot or so, if someone walked over and picked up your bag and walked away with it, you would be getting the notification from the data we collected from the GPS. But now, if your bag is sitting somewhere unattended, and someone was to walk up to it and unzip it and just start rummaging through it, we're going to be taking the data from the accelerometer and gyroscope to detect that small amount of motion. Integrated circuit. The ground guard is powered by an Atmel AVR 32U4 8-bit, 8 megahertz, 3.3 voltage logic level microprocessor. This is a very low voltage, low clock speed microprocessor that allows us to have decreased noise and radiation on the circuit board, which is critical when having a sandwich chip populated on the same board. That lowers the amount of impedance matching that needs to be done. It also allows us to get increased battery life because we have a much lower voltage than standard um, products function on. Real-time software. Products in the category of Internet of Things most commonly run on operating systems. They're usually very lightweight, like Android-type operating systems that you're writing software that's running on top of. When you have software running on top of an operating system, you're at the mercy of the operating system to execute your software correctly. Um, so if the operating system decides to go into a driver update while you're in the middle of, while your process is running, you could potentially have an issue if it's overriding it. So what we decided to do was write all of our software in embedded C. It's a little more time consuming, but it allows us to have much more control of what the hardware is doing at all times, which is protecting your belongings. To go into uh, detail on the build material and costing, I give you Engineer Mohammed. Thank you, Engineer Jack. Come on now. Um, I'd like to introduce the build material stage of our product. The grab guard is comprised of these components that you see up here. Um, one of the most important components was the Adafruit Fauna Atmel 32U4 um, processor, which is populated onto the board. In addition, we use a SIM card and a cellular chip, all in one package to make it smaller, more economical, and to make it less interference. All impedance matching on the board is built in. The, as you can tell, the Adafruit Feather was our most expensive product, and when in production, we'll have a, a significant price drop when we buy 10, and another price drop when we buy 100. Another important component of our product was the Tilt and Shake Click. Uh, this is basically an accelerometer and a gyroscope, which Jeff talked about earlier. Um, this is basically a little module that's populated with, the, with some supporting circuitry to make GravGuard a plug and play product. Marketing strategy. Uh, we're currently selling our product for $120. It costs $120, we're, we're currently selling for $250. And in production, we'll have a significant price drop by 40%, which will cost a total of $72. The question is, is your valuable worth more than $250? which means as an investor, you can make a lot of money. Um, this is the mobile aspect. I'm gonna hand it over to Lewis. Thank you very much. All right, this is the, the app that was created. Uh, the purpose of this app is so the uh, GrabGuard and uh, the, your phone to communicate uh, quickly and effectively and securely. So when we developed this app, we have, uh, just like your phone, has a pair. So we decided to come up with a pair that will connect onto your phone. But it's going to have a username and password as well. So no one else can, can tamper with it. 
So we're trying to look a little bit more to the future. This is a little, little later on after we, we move forward the product and make sure that everything is good. Um, not just by the app, we're actually trying to make the, the product smaller, okay? More portable, less noticeable in your backpacks or wherever you decide to put it in. Again, can you carry on that? No. Uh, we're, uh, we're currently, we, we, uh, we're trying to, um, after beta testing stage, we're currently in testing stage. We like to license our product. In addition, we like to add a shielding closure for less interference. And lastly, we like to distribute to local tech stores such as Best Buy, DC Richard and Son, and Costco eventually. Invest in your crust. Um, basically, this is Shark Tank, and you guys are investors. So we're looking for $100,000 for 50% of our company. And if you're asking where the money's going, $40,000 will go into hiring a uh, new engineering staff, $50,000 will go to manufacturing the product, and another $10,000 will go to inventory and warehouse. Our goal, basically what we're about. Our goal is not just to make money, but to help society evolve where people don't have to worry about their valuables being stolen. GrabGuard provides security and peace of mind for the consumer. The cost is very low and could, and could be found in a near local store. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, everybody. Uh, before we engage with ProTech on Q&A, to a first order, welcome once again to the folks who just came in. Welcome to CCM Engineering Shark Tank. As you can see, even the first presentations, no nerve, right? No anxiety, excited, truly <laughs> astute. Truly a capstone project, ELT 110, ENR 124, ENR 231, ELT 231, ELT 209. All of the knowledge that they've learned the past two years, they've exemplified today. So thank you so much. Bravo, and we will now do the Q&A. Right. Have, have a seat, gentlemen. Have a seat, gentlemen. Have a seat, gentlemen. Yeah, sure. I'll stand. I'll fine. I can just stand there. It doesn't matter. Whatever you want. Right? Yeah. Does anybody have you sit in one stand or actually? How about everybody sit down? <laughs> All right, any questions for ProTech? Your question could be very technically related. It could be based on commercial, on pricing. First question, first question. Hello? Hi, that's working. First question. Engineer Tom in the house, you are acting as an investor or partner engineer? Mr. Tom Fong. All right, Mr. Partner, engineer. partner engineer. Tom Fong. If you had to choose one. Want to license your product to? What company would that be? <coughs> Please. I'd say we uh, do, or we would uh, go with more like a bag. So like maybe like a like, Swiss like, gear, yeah, or something Swiss like gear, that. North Face, something. So something where as we decrease the size of the product, we can actually have it where it's built into one of the pouches where it's maybe not even removable. And we have something with like some type of inductive charger where you just set your bag on this little like dock type of thing. Inductively charges and so it's you're not even noticing it's in your bag. Okay. Very good question, partner Fulton. Client investor Philip. What's the average battery life on your device? It's twenty four hours of continuous alarming. So that comes out to like two weeks with the power saving modes enabled. And if you're getting roughly like three to five activations per day, which you're not going to see. It's going to be much less. How would you use the charging panel? I'm sorry? How would you use it to charge it? Back? Just as a plug on it. It's mm -hmm. very easy to charge. You can actually charge it because it has such a it runs on such a low voltage. You know those portable power banks you charge your cell phone with? You can charge it with one of those. What else work with wireless charging? Uh, no, we currently do not have it enabled for wireless charging. Okay, next questions. Engineer Randolph? Yeah, I'm just curious about like your apparatus. I noticed that you had it in that uh, little computer bag over here before. It seems like pretty tight stuff, but for like a gym bag like this, which is like loose and has like a lot of stuff in it, would the um, same rules of motion with the gyroscope work? Or is it more, does it work more like when you find the tight spaces? Well, we're actually going to develop a couple different settings on the device because the way we're demonstrating it today, we have it, um, 
We have it set up so it um, is only detecting a couple of ranges of motion, but we can have it where it's much more sensitive and can be like free, where it's like it can be loose in a bag and it just detects all motion. But for the presentation, we had a little, um, we decreased some of the features just to make it easier to present. Okay. But yes, it would function well in a bag like that. All right, more questions? Client Anthony. Um, let's say uh, Robert were to check in the bag and remove the device from the bag and leave it on the ground and just take the bag and move. There'd be some type of locking mechanism that you could put on the bag. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes, 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 yes. Okay. Well, if, if he's moving the device and you have it activated, it's going to show that motion and it's going to send you a text message. So at that point, you're going to know that your bag has been tampered with. So what we're trying to do also is um, the question that people probably ask, like, what happens if they just open the zipper and they go into it? We're also thinking about incorporating uh, some type of relay that will activate it if they open the, the zipper. So it will, there's multiple things, but just since this is just a prototype, um, and we're that, gonna, that's... And and we're going to make the product a lot smaller, so you won't be able to see it. If we, we do it. something with licensed manufacturing, and we're getting our product installed during the manufacturing of the actual bag, it will be a lot easier to incorporate types of sensors to the zippers. But because our product currently is so portable, you can put it in any bag. So to have you have to have like wiring up to the zippers. So we didn't think that was really the best option. Uh, let's take a question from over here. We got engineer <laughs> Michael. Is there a chance that this could be waterproof at any point? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's actually um, the enclosure we currently are using is IP69X, so it's it's very water and uh, waterproof and dustproof. But because of the specific siren we're working with, we actually had to cut a couple of holes in it to let the sound emit from the enclosure. So if we switch the siren, we could get it to emit through the waterproof enclosure. Okay. Good question. Engineer Jason. Yeah. Um, so what I've so far is that anytime you pick up the bag, it's going to go off, regardless of the being activated. You're, you're enabling and disabling it via text messages when you want to. So when you're in class and you're next to it, it's disabled. And then when you are reading unattended, you enable it. Now, we have played around with the functionality, or the feature, of if the bag doesn't move for a certain duration of time, it auto-enables. Because if you forget to enable it, you could potentially have an issue with your own protection. So we're still playing around with that, but that's like a good time. You're stages. probably going to do a survey, right, and do some other recap, whether you need to enable it when it's two minutes, three minutes in action. Engineer Pat. Engineer Pat. So, uh, kind of like when they're asking questions about if it was taken, does it have like last known location or like motion prediction on it to so maybe where the object is going? You guys want to do that? Yeah. Um, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. So, if someone t does take it, does it have features such as like last known location or motion prediction? Um, I'm not sure about motion prediction, but for the GPS, yeah, I think we could uh, get last known location in case that uh, like the bag was stolen with the alarm and they disabled it somehow, which can't happen. We would know where the bag was at all times. I think the question is very cloud enabled. Is your device cloud enabled? <laughs> well, because it has cell service, as long as you're connected cellularly, which depending if you're in a dead zone or not, as long as you have cell service, we can communicate with it. So we're collecting data at all times. So yes, it would be the last known location. We can entertain another five, six minutes of questions, guys. More questions from ProTech, really interesting products. Engineer Steve? How do you think this product is going to make its place to the market with objects like Tile and well, various love? We did, in order to develop this product, we actually looked into a lot of solutions on the market. And the issue that we found with all the products that are currently on the market, they either have Bluetooth, where you're not getting any communication, tiles, as an example, is Bluetooth enabled. So it, I think it's Bluetooth and actually Wi-Fi, depending on the specific model you use. The problem with that is, though, you, if you don't have Bluetooth connected to it, as soon as you're out of that 30-foot range, you're done. Or unless you're near Wi-Fi that's unlocked and the device script can actually connect to it, which is very unlikely. So it's not, we, we, there's nothing really, we, we, we took a lot of features from a lot of different products that are trying to achieve similar things and we kind of incorporated them all together that, to make a much more well-rounded product. I have a question for product manager, project engineer Mo. Mo, from a costing standpoint, have you thought of volume type of pricing? I think we had engineer Tom ask about bundling strategy with 
Umbro or Fitbit or something, but have you thought of volume pricing? Because yeah, we have you know the youth who have a certain amount of budget, right? So yes. yeah, have you thought of volume pricing? Yes. Our product currently costs two hundred fifty dollars, which is expensive for most students. But when we're in production mode, there should be a forty percent drop. So it costs us one twenty. We're selling for two fifty. If it costs us forty percent drop, what we call a total of seventy two dollars. So as long as we make a uh, like two hundred to one fifty range, we're, we're pretty. We're going to pass on a percentage of the cost. Of when we increase volume, there's a price break. We're going to pass on some of that price break on the consumer. So, so for more and more, you you've seen that in data food, you've seen the prices yeah. go down with volume yes. based on features. But, right. Terrific. More questions for ProTech? I'm going to be an investor. Client, in, invest, investor Roscoe. So uh, as an investor, I'm curious on the market share marketability. Do you feel that this is a product that is geared more towards early adopters, uh, the more standard user, or more like legacy users, like older folks, and folks that are maybe not so technologically yeah. It's definitely from early adopters, and we're hoping to branch in to just average consumers because we feel that it's an issue that everyone has. So once the early adopters, as you know, start grabbing onto it, then other people, oh, what's that? Your, your tech guru friend has it, and then you see it, and then hopefully you can get some, some more market share. Cool. Good How about more, more questions? More questions from insurance companies. Uh, uh, Engineer Logan from Insurance Company Prudential. Going back to something you said earlier about what you intend to do with the, uh, the bag sitting for a while and then it activates. What happens if, say, I have it in my bag overnight, but then I just run in the rush in the morning, pick it up and go? It's going to go off, isn't it? Yes. So, what are you going to do? Is there a way you can do something else about that? Well, for developing the app, so you can enable and disable it. So we can actually take the app and tie in. This gets kind of complex. But for instance, you have your phone, and when you're sleeping, it's in sleep mode. So we can actually do things where, when the phone is in, we have the app running on the phone, and it can tell how long it's been in sleep mode. So it can tell that you've been sleeping or like offline for multiple hours. Then when you enable the phone, when you hit the side button and power it up, it comes out of sleep mode. We can record that, and then based on that, we can actually send data to the bag to let it know that you're now in motion, so you can set buffers so you can pick it up and walk away with it without a while. Yeah, good question. I mean, just one comment about that from a capsule perspective, ELP 209 computer programming, that could actually be artificial intelligence, right, behavior. If you can actually understand the behavior of the user, that's probably a way and it also, to address Because that. it is GPS, you're getting time. So you can actually know the time of the day based on your geographical location. So you can have, like, if you don't want to get that complex, you can just set parameters where you know you're going to be moving from, like, 8 in the morning until 9 in the morning on your commute. Don't walk. Like, there's a lot of very simple ways to approach that also. Thank you for that. <coughs> More questions, especially from those who have a lot of expensive valuables. Engineer client. Yes, go ahead. I just want to ask, um, so you mentioned the app. How user-friendly is the app? Uh, the app is going to be actually pretty simple. It's pretty basic. Um, it's pretty much just old. So what we're, we're doing for the right now is just it's going to have a username and password, um, just just like anything else, because you don't want anybody to pretty much hack into your own uh, device. So you're going to be you're uh, going to do username and password, and from there you're just going to uh, activate or disactivate buttons. Um, if you saw in the diagram, that's pretty much it's just going to it's going to have a button that says. Uh, 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 enable to look for any devices that's going to pair, just like your regular phone. It's just a more secure way to to have it. Yes. You, you were thinking like one or two pages, right? It's not going to have like this long yes, it's it's setting. Yeah. Kind of like the Windows phone setup, where it's very like clean and it's just a series of like icons. Do you have uh, any plans to make it more customizable? Uh, that's something that we might look into, but at this moment we haven't decided yet. It's something more in the future. If you're willing to, you know, put money down or <laughs> willing to you know take into consideration. <laughs> Actually, do you, so what I'm getting at is you have to use the app. Uh, I, it's yeah. yeah. 
And then you lose. At one point, ProTech had the app working, though, right? Yes, the, the app. Yeah. The you app describe works. that experience. Yep. Yeah, the app worked just fine. Uh, I connected it, did everything. Um, we we're gonna bring it in and try to do it, but it's kind of hard for us to show everybody from a phone. So maybe really couldn't just. That's why we just took uh, an image of it and just to show you what we actually did. Um, for coding this, it was pretty intense. Uh, there's back. Uh, there's massive amount of things that you have to do differently, but we found a, a good template and we just had to adjust a few things and create our own at the point. And you, Randolph? Do you fear competition or do you welcome the opportunity for inspiration and possible mergers in your own market? I think we want competition. Competition makes everything better. With any type of business. We rise to the challenges. <laughs> Make a strive to do better and keep. So one guy probably taking notes. I think he is. That's right. All right. Uh, one more question, and I have one final question for as well. I one more question. Yes, ma'am. As a consumer, so you're saying that I could take it out of the country and it would work with a different SIM card. The carriers here, for instance, like Ting, I mean, uh, referenced earlier, Ting is set up strictly from the United States. They run, they, they use the same frequencies, even though it's not the FCC, it's like the other um, communication licensing overseas. Those are the same, it runs on, I think it's like 800 megahertz, 1300, 1800, and like 2150 or something. It's using the exact same radio module, but you have to go and get like core or like a different service provider. That's in that country? Correct. Okay, and then also my other question is, that little box, wherever you put it in your bag, so it's going to text me if somebody's moving it, and is it also setting off the alarm at the same time? Yeah, you can actually enable if you want to just get text, an alarm, or vice versa, or both. Well, I wouldn't hear the alarm. The alarm would be yeah. in the bag, you don't and want somebody's, alarm, okay. You don't have to have alarm. Thank you. Fantastic. And just one final question from, from a capsule. Oh, actually, Engineer Lee, a partner. I just wanted to uh, put my input in terms of um, Implementing the alarm along with the um, with the texting, despite the fact that you as the bag holder may not hear the alarm, having an alarm go off is immediately a deterrent for anyone around because immediately you're drawing attention to them. So it could work that way as well. That could be a deterrent. Can you set the alarm tone? <laughs> yeah, I mean, with your investment, it could be configurable. You could increase the case. Of All right, one final question from me, guys. Um, uh, Engineer Jeff Lane mentioned the bill of materials. Can you mention the coursework that you had to study and go through in order to come up with that bill of material? The microcontroller, the you know, 9 go ahead. So I'm not fully understanding. You're saying, how did we develop the bill of materials? That's right. Like so what from a capsule perspective, what did you learn at CCM, i.e. all your education, oh, to, oh, to oh, develop oh, the product? Oh, it could be Lewis or Jeff. It could be Lewis or Jeff. Active circuit design, I said. I search components were a big key of learning how to build materials and going through the engineering process. We also used uh, Professor Balakis with the uh, MOSFET, yes. um, it, which even though we do op, op amps, it gives us uh, some ideas because uh, op amps are pretty much a bunch of transistors inside of it, which uh, also have to do, we also got the opportunity to learn from uh, the integrated chips was at uh, was the cart uh, select class. Oh, uh, you'll be doing it. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Micro next digital microprocessors. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And we feel like this program, from the second you start, you're instantly exposed to ICs, even if it's just the 7400s. Yeah. So you're instantly getting components and you're seeing prototyping. So the biggest thing was when we started to develop the product, we just wanted to start getting components in and start getting dirty and like getting the, getting the product going because you have to wait for all these things to come in. So that was how we initially started. We just ordered a bunch of stuff and we just started prototyping and then it really came together and we were able to hone it in to find the product you're today. Perfect, perfect. Any other questions? I have a uh, uh, question and recommendation. Uh, you said it takes very little power. Yeah. Is it possible that it's such a little bit of power that you could have just a device that uses the shaking of it to generate the power to actually power it? It's not that low. It's not <laughs> nanowatt. Okay. There are nanowatt devices that are like that. It's not running that because it has a transmitter and receiver. <coughs> okay. We actually have multiple transmitters and receivers because we have the Bluetooth and we have the cellular. And even though we can put those into like hibernation sleep mode, we still are burning some power. 
Great question. Thousand, thousand. I have one more question. Are you willing to give up 51% for the 100,000? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's controlling, controlling interest. Forget I'd ask. <laughs> one final question from, from client. Hi, Jerry. Yes. Okay. Also, well, actually, the mobile hotspots is using the same card. No, we don't currently have it configured that way. The the GSM chip that we work with is really running 2G because we're using it primarily for SMS. So if we well, we could potentially go down a route like that. The problem with that is we're late enough to start getting into like using the Verizon 4G LTE chips, and it ends up scale, like now you're running out of board space. You can't go with like the low profile Qualcomm multi integrated chips and things like that. So it can, it like the scope creep of that can get really big really quick. If it was something that one of our investors was really interested in, we definitely would uh, entertain the idea. It's wonderful. That's a really extremely impressive. Yeah, we need to wrap, the, wrap it up so we go to the second group. Thank you so much, Rotec. That was extremely impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are SDI, and our product is a solar panel safety interrupt product, or for short, the Simbox. Right, this is our group. I'm Daniel Trinidad. That's Adam. That's Will. And this is Warren. We're going to start off with a video just to show what the problem is. In San Francisco now, a firefighter was shocked by some solar panels while trying to put out a house fire. We sent Mike Beats Cake and Garrett to find out exactly how did this happen. Charles and Pierce went home for lunch to save some money. Little did he know, he would end up saving his home. If I didn't go home for a sandwich, my house would be burnt. Charleston told me he sat down to eat right around 1.30. I smelled uh, burnt, a burnt smell. So I asked my neighbor, I asked some friends, and like I smell something, something going on we don't know about. But he didn't see anything because the fire was on the roof. There was a wire that was going across the street, hit my chimney, and it caused some kind of electricity spark, and my uh, chimney caught on fire. He called for help. Battalion Chief Michael Thompson was one of the firefighters who responded, and as he was fighting the flames, he noticed something. In the course of fighting the fire, I looked up and saw it was my friend's house that was on fire. The two men have been friends for decades. Now Michael was charged with helping to save his friend's home. The good news, firefighters succeeded, but there was still extensive damage. I would say it was an electrical fire caused by exterior electrical coming off of the of the, of the, of the fight took an unusual turn when one firefighter got injured, not by the flames, but the solar panels on the roof. It's possible that the solar panels, we had water up on the roof, so it could have been electrical coming off the solar panels into the water, which is a great conduit, and the firefighter was standing in water. The firefighter that was shocked suffered injuries to both his hands, but we're told he is expected to be okay. On the night, <coughs> At this point, the fire is considered an accident. So. In San Francisco. Right. I can give you guys a few seconds to read this, but basically the problem is that when fires happen and there's solar panels, it's the, the danger is increased by a lot because of the electricity. And <coughs> this first one, the, no, it basically says the only thing firefighters fear is more than just fire is the solar. And in this other one, we have, uh, it says that the firefighters start defensive firefighting. Defensive firefighting is when the firefighter just say, we need to stop, forget about the house, the house is going, has gone. We need to start protecting the other houses or whatever surround the house. So that's not what you want. You don't want your house to just go away like that. All right, this, the issues are the more houses are turning to solar, so. Uh, over the years, solar panels and solar energy has been on the uprise. And with more houses turned to this, it's going to be an increased problem because every house, like, accidents happen, houses get caught on fire. And the safety issues are being overlooked. 
Firefighters fear for their safety and will not fight a fire because there's a solar panel there. Obvious reasons, electricity and water. I have more. Okay, so now we're talking about the growth of solar panels and how we turn into solar panels. So in 2001 and 2012, New Jersey and Arizona are the largest uh, house, house uh, owners that own solar panels. And solar panels can make up 20% of global electricity by 2027. And currently, right now, the recent studies right now, we're at about 5% in global electricity. And we in the US are 1% in global electricity compared to hydro, wind, and coal. Uh, so in two, 2006, 30,000 homes in solar panels had, had solar panels. Uh, back then, solar panels were about nine dollars per watt, and as time grew on and more people developed and had technology got cheaper, today it's about three seventy nine. So that's about a third of the cost previous. Um, so Inside of Tech Energy is a huge uh, solar panel uh, company. Six million Americans are actively searching for solar panels, and about. 300,000 of them will end up buying solar panels this year. Um, so Germany have the most solar panels installed in the country, in the developed country. Uh, we are the fourth compared to Spain and uh, France. Uh, All right. So what happens when you have a solar panel fire is you have fire, 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 firefighters come to your house like normal, right? They're going to do a survey to see, so they're going to go around the bank, right? What they're supposed to do is, if there's if there's fire, if they see that there's solar panels, uh, what they need to do is before they start firefighting, they need to set up ladders, they need to climb on your roof, mm -hmm. and the current technique is they take big tarps or blankets and they cover the panels. The idea is is that by covering the panel it won't be able to produce electricity, so your system becomes safe, right? This sounds like a great idea on paper, but in a practical application, you got somebody climbing on your house that's on fire, and it's like, like oh, no, no, don't put any water, don't, don't do anything, let's start with the blankets. The other thing that's really cute about fires and solar panels is not every, every tarp is the same, so it's depending on the material, and the color, and a lot of different variables, it may or may not work. So, the, uh, as you can see, the, uh, now you get this other, this other cute one. Everybody's coming up with new solar panels. Right. So here's your good question for anybody. Right. Which one's the solar panel? <laughs> the top right, well the center is the solar panel. I've seen the solar panels a little bit the top right. They all are. Oh, wow. They're yeah, all every one of those is wow. solar panels. Right? So when, you, when you're looking at a solar, when you know these guys who may or may not know, code of fire, they go, oh, no, that's just a regular roof. Let's start fighting the fire. And they're putting themselves at a lot of risk. Because the other thing is that solar panels, when you have a solar panel, is they're always on. If there's light, the solar panel's working. It doesn't matter if it's. If it's the sun, it doesn't matter if it's the lights from like an emergency vehicle or anything like that, or light coming off of the fire. So all of a sudden, you, you might say, oh, we got it covered. Oh, no, we missed one. Now you, now you have black electricity again. The, the solar panels are producing DC electricity, and current firefighting techniques are based around an AC world, which is most of your house electricity. So they have a hot stick, so they can take the thing they can scan and any live wires in the house they can see them. Then they go, wait, hold on a minute, we gotta pull the panel, we gotta do different things, you know, to shut off the electricity before bringing water. With the DC, that doesn't work. You can't see it, so they're going in blind, fighting a fire, uh, as to whether or not they're gonna get electrocuted. And you can't shut them off. The, the, the most common technique that for insulation now, they're not really, sh you know, shut, you can't shut them down. So this is, this is pictures of them Doing this, and this is a, this is from a demonstration of how to shut down, you know, how to how to cover these things. You see, you got to have 
two or three guys climbing up on the roof. You gotta pull out the blanket and do this. And now you're doing this in the middle of a fire. Right. Like it's not a real practical solution. So we came up with the sim box. Oh, the yeah, the sim box. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Features. So with the goal of the sim box, as you can see on the table, we we want to stop the electricity. We can't shut off the panels, so that's out of the picture. But what we can do is cut the power as close to the panel as possible. So there's, for our device, we're thinking about it shutting off. And sometimes you can't see the fire. Sometimes the fire could be in the walls, as in the example video, the fire's on the roof. And nobody knew what was happening. So on top of a manual, on top of being shut off by fire alarms, you can also shut it off manually. The cool thing with the fire alarms is that with code nowadays, every house is required to have fire alarms hooked up so that when one goes off, they all go off. So there's already a signal we can tap off of that will turn the system off, which is very handy. Um, we decided to go with a nice high visibility orange for our product <laughs> so that when firefighters are there, there's no, oh no, where is this? Is it there? Maybe they haven't, maybe they don't automatically now. We were, all, we were also thinking about making a sign, which we can put in front of house. It's very similar to ADT security system. Sign goes in front of the house, firefighters drive up, they see it, they know they're in good hands. Um, with the box itself, there are two colors. There's a red and a green light to represent on and off. We do plan on expanding that so we have a light in the front so that firefighters don't have to run into the house. They can be outside to see that it's off and be good. So how does it work? I kind of went over that a little bit, but the fire alarm will trigger the device. The fire alarm, which we have on the table in the container over there, it outputs a 12 volt signal that will be distributed to all the fire alarms in the house with a proper setup. Um, it'll kill all the wires in the house DC wise. AC is still in the firefighter's hands, but that is something they take care of and have been taken care of very well. It's a lot easier for them to manage than with these solar panels. With that system being off, they are safe. All right. Here's Ready. the fun part. The best, the best, the best part. This is fun. Okay. Safety interruption module and the demonstration. Oh. So. Eventually we'll be blowing them out, putting the fire alarm on top, and showing the device working. But before that, I have a few simple questions to ask you guys. So if I were to hook this man up, turn on the power supply, set it to 12 volts, and turn it on, <coughs> then 
dragon flames. There's power. Now, let's say, theoretically, fire alarm goes off. What will happen? Will the fan keep running? Serious question. If the fire alarm is in the spinning block, will this still be running? Yeah, probably. Okay. Now that's, for this case, it's okay. AC power, they can shut it off. The bag will deflate. And all is okay. Everyone's safe. Now, if there are, however, you have a fire. They don't want to have a fire in the library. <laughs> no. If there were solar panels, that would be a different story. They will be constantly generating energy. So now, with our box, we put in power, we plug in our system, and now this is something key to note. When we turn it on, the red light goes off. Every time the system is turned on, it is off. We don't want it to be on for some odd reason, if there's a power surge, because then we, know we won't be able to determine whether it's an on-off state, it's not stable. When we click this button here, it turns on the system, the bag inflates. So that's our manual turn on, turn off. We hit the button again, system's off, as you can see by the bag deflating. Perfect. Now, this is where the fun starts. We will now demonstrate this working with a fire alarm. So if you like your hearing, you can cover your ears. This is about 80 decibels, so it's not... Really like them. Yeah, really like them. So I guess for the people seeing, we'll have some more talk. Okay. So, here's a quick warning. We will not. Oh, turn it on. Bag, bag and thing. Yeah. The system is now on. So. We need the LED with the light. It's now. I'm going to blow out the candles. The smoke will be produced. I'm going to put the fire alarm on top. So blow it on. What we can do, though, is, is bypass the system. It's not a bad thing that there's a lot of, not a lot of smoke. <laughs> there's a fire alarm right there. We wouldn't want our own fire alarm. What we can do, however, is that fire alarm, if you click the test button, it will still send the 12 volt signal. So I'm going to click the test button now. And the system is multiple uses, not that you want to have a lot of fires at your house, but let's say, for example, you're not the best of cooks. Fire alarms go off, system goes down. You wouldn't want to buy any one of these every time. So, it turns back on. Good little assistance. And you're good. So that is the demonstration of the device working. Really impressive SDI. Fantastic. And the nice thing about this product is that overall with all the components, it is very cheap. This cost us approximately $5, and we can go cheaper and we can make it better. So there's room for improvement, I'm not going to lie, but we are showing that it is working and we can, we can do more. So these are our future plans. And it's, um, what we really want to do is get recognition and certification by uh, accepted firefighting organizations. We're, we're, we've been already talking with uh, IAFF, which is the International Association of Firefighters. And what they do is they write the standard operating procedures mm -hmm. for firefighting for firefighters. So they provide education to the firefighters. So by, by teaming up with them, we can have the system, we can have them trained on our thing so they know what to do. When they see this, they're not, they're not gonna freak out. Firefighters are comfortable with the safety and they'll know that they can proceed and fight this fire safely without, um, without fear. 
Um, we also want to change building code. Is currently new construction requires that all any new construction you have to have a hardwired firefighter uh, fire uh, fire alarms in your in your house. We want to do that also when you're going to put solar panels in. It's a good thing to have anyway. So why not when you have the solar panels in there? We can hook right into it. It's really simple. It gives us a market. Um, it's very easy to work with pre-existing solar panels. So if you put solar panels in your house and you're going, oh man, now I want this thing. You know, it's really easy to hook up. It's not, it's not real hard. We're going to work with people that already have them and work with installers to get that system <coughs> in people's houses so that their houses are safe. Because of the, it works with any t any smoke alarm that sends a signal. So there's international markets as well. Um, you know, solar. You know, like, solar's newer here, but like we said, like like Warren was saying, in the world, it's taking off a bit. It's the next step. So that's us. That's STI and our Simbox. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I'd like to thank all the administration for coming. A really thank nice thanks to Professor Cartano. He helped us go throughout the whole procedure. He's been here for us for many semesters, and we'd like to really thank you. You're welcome, Danny. Great job. Yeah. Terrific. All right, SDI, have, have a seat. Question and answer. All right, another round of applause for SDI, guys. They can see it live. They can see it live. You can raise it. Absolutely. As you can see, ProTech with GrabGuard is more on the consumer side. When it comes to SDI Simbox, it can actually be part of building code or policy. Just imagine that, right? Engineering influencing building code and policy. All right, let's take the first question for SDI, the safety interruption module box that could save lives. Client Randolph. Yeah, I noticed earlier in the uh, presentation, they meant, you guys mentioned something about like wall fires. Um, provided like if there isn't like smoke being output through those wall fires, would it be like a better idea to have like, a thermal detector or some sort of like hooked up to this SDI device to more accurately fight fires? Well, for our system, it's going, the box itself, it doesn't have any units. It's whatever you put into it. So if you have CO monitors, if you have, you know, any of your firefighting, you know, any of your regular standard uh, fire alarms are going to be hooked up. It's it's whatever you hook into the thing. So what you propose is a somewhat customizable input device method? It, it, well, it's completely, it, it's completely customizable. Our box is literally taking whatever signal you put in there. If you wanted to put, you know, like, that, that's how we can do the shut off, the manual shut off as well. Is it's it's an input, you know. You're you're putting in input saying, I want it off. So is the connecting method going to be via some sort of centralized plug? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Next question. But good question though. Modular system. Modular system. Investor Baliki. Investor Baliki. User. Uh, a user. 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 Owner of a solar system. Huh? This is rather light. Yeah. You mentioned the. Firefighters Organization. Does the National Fire Protection Association have any standards for solar systems? Currently? Currently, yes. What's that? They have one, sort of. They're not, it's kind of a up in the air. You know, it's 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 a newer, it, it's one of the things where research. it's, they haven't really addressed it because they're, there's a lot of, of myths and a lot of rumors going around. They're not 100% you know, and a lot of the systems are the committee that writes a standard on solar systems made up of uh, companies that manufacture people that use it, even CCM. Well, this building doesn't have the panels on it, does it? The no, only the parking lot panels. Yeah. That one across the way, though, has panels. And the other panels are out in the parking lot. Yeah. They're not so, right. so I guess for us to get with more research and more research. They did some research on it already, but, but based on your research so far, nothing right there. No, no. Uh, you, you see a hundred different things. You know, like, you know, one, one, people, one group says this, another one says this, another one says this, and 
you don't really have a standard, you know, this is what happens. What about the National Electric Code? Does the National Electric Code address solar panels on the projected there is one code which I've seen going around which requires a manual shutoff, a large switch on the outside of the building. But if that's the inside, in the inside. It's, there is a large switch between where the DC comes from the solar system to the inverts, in between the, the junction box, the big shuttle. Mm -hmm. So now, that if the house is on fire, who's going to run down in the basement and flip that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that's that's, that's why the opportunity. That, that could be that, a simbox too. That's why that's that's, that's why I'm <laughs> is uh, you know like in a fire, what they're going to do for your AC coming in, they're going to pull the panel, right? If we put a simbox right next to it, all they got to do is go, right? and then the, your DC is shut off as well. Instead of having to go down, like you're saying, go to the basement or go find it by doing the standard with the building code. Where you have here's your if you if you want to do solar here's your AC panel here's your DC panel so you can just have the shutoffs right there as a standard instead of a customized system. The mm -hmm. other thing you have is like you said in your system you did you're having DC coming straight straight down into your box. Well, that's all systems. Well, no, you also have some of the well, other systems. Well, no, there are the, the inverters. The, uh, you, you have the micro inverters, micro -inverters, on, inverters. on the panel, you know, to address the solar, but you have added expense and then it, it's you just have different systems we're trying to go for a standard standard system a standard system with the code so that everything's the same with the micro inverter system at less likely of fire starting it, i mean it might be a little bit more controllable right. so you might have a little less fire but the original systems everybody went with the dc inverter down as a single inverter instead of the micro inverters on the panels Good. So um, with the non disclaimer, another meeting at Panera okay. or a business meeting. Okay. <laughs> I think we have another um, question from the so audience. This is further next Monday. That's the topic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Question for STI. Yeah, I just want to add, add to what we're talking about with the system. We would like you to be a great system with solar panels. I'm, I'm a captain of the fire department. And the fire department works in teams. There's a team that the truck company would go in and turn off all the power. And so that would be something that they would go to first if they're aware of it. So um, another thing too, the demonstration didn't work with the fire with the smoke alarm. If there was nothing burning, that was like a piece of paper or something like that. Next time for your demonstration, if you're in front of Shark Tank, use a metal can, put something in there, um, the candles, the same thing. Just put a piece of paper or something in there to burn. Okay. Yeah, something small. For a really big burn. Right? You have a fire extinguisher at hand so that you can, you know, That's hit it and okay. control it if something happens. But I like your idea because solar panels, you know, you treat that as a charged system, just like a power. Yeah. You can't hit water with it because electricity would go from the water and go all the way back to you and, you know, you get hit with electricity. So, with something like that, your idea is really a great idea because then we could properly um, do vertical ventilation on the roof to release the superheated gases from the fire, um, you know, from the room that has the fire. So it'd be excellent. But keep that in mind, the fire department works in teams. Every crew has a job, you know. You got one crew that hits the lights, one crew that has the water with the charge attack line, another crew that searches for victims. So keep that in mind. Learn that, learn that so that you can describe the way your system works with more problems. Fantastic. Fantastic feedback. Team Fire Fighting, Team Captain. I was going to ask, so one box per system? You don't need it. It's not per panel. How does, I mean, so without giving any proprietary, proprietary information. So again, basically one box would shut down the whole system one box would shut the system uh, it depends on it's complete it's so what is it really disabling the dc because the panels are making dc right up to the end of the wire yeah mm -hmm. it, it's cutting it our cutoff like th this demonstration is uh, proof of concept for an actual installation your cutoffs would be at the panel you'd have a switch at every panel at that would panel. be activated by your it's activated box. by the box right. yes yeah, and then 
like, like I was saying, you could have multiple boxes around the house right. so that that are all on the same same idea. So you could, you know, like, you know, like if you're if you're a bad cook and you set the fire alarm off all the time, you just go, uh, you hit like like if you blew a circuit, you know, you pop the breaker, you go, oh, whoops, then let me start it over again. So then you're not shutting off your system. Right. But so we're back again to the original thing. So we could have a, you could have a manual push button switch that would be near the, the, the regular AC yes. box. Yes, yes. That yes. something you could hit on the outside based on the big emergency button. Yep. Right. So technical part of point is, uh, we did talk about that also during the past 14, 15 weeks of the design and the quality standpoint, but from proof of concept standpoint, you wanted to emphasize that mm -hmm. they can scale up with additional funding and research and development, but that topology we talked about already. All right, um, more questions for SDI, Simbox. Yeah, he was right there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, no, no, oh no, 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 Jerry, Jerry. Jerry. Yeah, he was right there. Yeah. Yeah. You know the concept of the old fashioned pull box, right? Like how the fire alarm would know where it is? Are you planning on making it wireless so it can connect to a fire department, to a computer system? So it's like, oh, like house on like one, two, three maple ads on fire, you know, or the breaker shut down. So if you had that as part of your system, like if you had a, a home security system or something like that, then yes, it would. In general, it depends on how you install. You know, like we're just tapping in off of the signal. We're not. We're, we're using what's already there. Okay. All right, a few more questions. Next five minutes worth of questions. Javier, client uh, Javier. How does it work? Good question. Um, we actually do have a slide for that. Just so you can do it. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, that yeah, the question from the audience from Engineer Javier is how does it literally work? They mentioned simplicity of design. Yeah. How does it work? Uh, you can read it. I'll give you a better visual if you want to see. Uh, it starts off with. Now you can hear see that. Uh, it starts off with the power. So we have the power going to the voltage regulator just to keep it constant. Uh, the voltage regulator then goes to uh, our lobby that powers the whole entire thing. So we have so we have our AFK to OR gates and OR gates. Then going to this is our on and off switch, which is our, that's our set and reset. And then we have the signal from this. And we all we have a little uh, input, which is the signal from the fire alarm saying that there is a fire. And then all from this, which we use a fan for our load, but you can use anything for your load. For this, it would be the house itself. That's where the final thing would go. Okay. Any additional questions? I'm especially curious if there is a question about commissioning, installing, all of that. Can it be done by consumer stuff like that? Engineer Tom. I have a question as like a, an investor, <coughs> like a project up. What's to stop, say, like the lead uh, starting on company to just make one themselves and put it in with their installation, as opposed to coming with like a third party and putting their, your, I mean, ours is cheap, I mean. <laughs> Well, that's, that's hopefully the goal, is for the solar companies to so start taking So they'll license it out to a solar yeah. company? Yeah. yeah. We don't. There's, and there's already existing houses with solar panels on it, and I don't want to buy a new system. Because buying a new solar panel is expensive on its own, but you save money from the energy and the low maintenance you have to put on it. Yeah, but like if they were to make their own and then sell it to you or like add it on, like after the fact if you get into the panels, what would be to stop them? After the fact? Like so if they have the solar panels and they come out with what you guys have, what's to stop them from just selling that? Patent. Patent. 
the wind control panel yeah. thing, yeah. yeah. All right, any other uh, interior, Steve? Um, for your system, I have like two things. Um, is it designed to interface with commercial building fire monitoring systems, or is it always designed to be a standalone system? Because commercial buildings all have a, like a central main fire management system that's usually signified by the big red box somewhere in the building. Is your system designed to piggyback with that and possibly interface with it, or is it designed to specifically exist as a standalone item? Yeah, definitely piggyback with that. Because all it needs to be is next to that system and taken some sort of voltage that says fire alarms are on, turn off. So definitely we would like to meld with that so that you don't have to spend a large amount of money. We're not trying to gouge people with this product. We want to help them. We want them to save their bucks. We want to make sure that everybody is a okay and safe. So definitely we want to meld with that. Okay. And my second thing, um, as far as interfacing with uh, fire companies and fire safety, um, when it comes to signifying that a building not only has solar panels, is there any kind of markings that they put on buildings now? I don't think so. And no. if so, then that's something you might want to put yeah. in. As far as, like, I know they have on buildings, they signify yeah. different roof structures, um, especially for residential buildings, um, truss style roofs and everything. There's actually a triangle outside as an R for a truss style roof. Maybe think about something you could do for solar panels and then say that there's a solar panel interlock system. That would look. We were talking that during, there was like an ADT, I mean, you go back to the ADT security, that little sign from the say, oh, that's there. That's what we were trying to do with ours so that everybody, the firefighter goes there, they know that there is this, the same box there, and it's easy. It's not, they don't have to go on the roof and do the they just go there and turn it off. As well as a light that can be near the sign to show live or dead. So that not only do they know it's there, they know that the system that it's working with. Good. Two final questions. Final question. Final two. Client Randolph. So my pops work in the construction union, and they always like want to do a bunch of hurdles with the electricians trying to like retrofit buildings for new uh, electrical systems based on ball and cozy mandates. Uh, how do you plan on like arguing your case to like uh, OSHA and like all these different like construction unions to like? put your electrical system in and like have it like weigh the cost of manpower that they would have to invest to like retrofitting. It's a loaded, it's a loaded question. Yeah. It's more of a social yeah, more social responsible question that right there. Yeah. We're we're not making we're not trying to make this a difficult process for anyone. We want to make it very simple so that when they're setting up the system we want so that when they, they're normal, what they normally have to do is an, enough for us to just slide our system in. We don't want to make it pain. We're hopefully making it so that we can incorporate this with solar panels so that we can do brand new. We don't have to worry about adding something on top of it. It's just prepackaged, and you have to buy the module which will detect. Um, in terms of working with, with OSHA, OSHA, I think we could convince to have this product since it is for the better of the people in terms of working and for the people who are working putting it together it shouldn't be much very difficult for them to just simply add it in um, i hope that answered your question <coughs> okay, good and the final question will be from myself can you speak to the learning at ccm that enabled you to produce this project this product Go ahead. So, yeah. That's the capital project. It definitely helped us because it taught us most of the logic. Uh, well, act, active circuit components helped us because we did use BJT, BJTs inside the uh, uh, internal design. For stress boundaries with the, uh, the, with the industrial, with the uh, tri thermal regulators to regulate voltage and yes. stuff like that, that really yes. is key, especially for this because uh, we did it here today with a, a power supply because this is a scaled down model. But like in actual production, our our thing would be powered off of the solar panels, you know, and you don't always have a consistent voltage. So regulating that voltage is really important. So you have a consistent power for your logic. Perfect. Transistors, regulators. What else? Any any microcontroller you design? It seems like yeah, that was some digital no, principles. Okay. We yeah, use the, we, we the principles, good yeah. logic, yeah. Yeah, we use logic and our chips, good, terrific. 
Professor Balaki, final question. Well, uh, comment. Comment, comment. Uh, because it was a sewer problem, the lecture yesterday. that we would, ha would have had on solar systems yesterday evening didn't happen. It will happen next week. <laughs> so it's happening after. Not that they probably would have changed their presentation at all based on what they would have heard yesterday evening from 6.30 to 9 o'clock. That's right. That's right. Fantastic demonstration. We got feedback from the captain of the firefighting team as well about moving this forward as a phase two, phase three. Perhaps with some funding, we can move it to phase two, phase three by talking to the teams, their roles, and so forth. Right? Impressive job, SDI. Thanks for making us proud. Thank you so much. All right. All right, once again, our third group, BHT Security with the wristwatch. Take it away. All right, good evening, good evening everyone. Uh, as Professor Gartano introduced, we are BHG Security, a subsidiary of CCM Gartano Industries, and we're actually here to talk to you today about our product, the wristwatch. Obviously, a play on words. Um, first of all, just to introduce us as the engineers on this project, uh, we have Joe Flynn right behind me, assistant product engineer, head of social outreach as well as market research. Uh, Christian Romazzo was our head product engineer and head of research and development as well and I as well was the assistant product engineer and head of marketing and distribution. Uh, what the wristwatch was meant to be was a type of monitoring system, a security system for children out on the playground or out at recess in schools. Um, the idea is obviously classrooms are becoming overcrowded these days and not everyone, not all of the teachers assigned to watch all of the children at once can keep their eye on everyone at once. That's why we. Uh, actually have our slogan there, when you lose sight, keep your peace of mind. The idea being that every, every child on the playground will be wearing one of these wristbands and it'll assist teachers in knowing that even if they lose sight of the children, they'll know if they you know, have walked out of the boundaries of the school or out of the recess area or if they're potentially in any kind of danger or any real threat. So that was the real idea behind our project and that's what inspired us to uh, create this. Pass off the presentation. Sure. Okay, so we we're trying to come up with ideas for this project. Uh, we wanted to develop some of public safety. Uh, we thought child safety would be a good idea or a good contribution to, to society. Um, while we were brainstorming, we felt that recess uh, safety during recess was lacking a lot. Um, a couple problems we had was. Uh, um, uh, we feel that security is lacking when it comes to safety of children during recess. Um, there's problems associated with this. Children by nature are unskilled at, uh, at judging situations, uh, so therefore the recess safety needs to be enhanced. Another problem is the child to teacher ratio. Uh, there's too many children, not enough teachers to watch over the, the students. Um, I, have a, I have a statistic about this that I found on uh, the National Center of Education Statistics. Um, uh, the average classroom size from the 2011-2012, this is the most recent up-to-date statistic on this. There is 21 students per classroom in elementary schools. Uh, Naturally, when you multiply that by the number of classes out of recess at a given moment, that's far too many students for a handful of, team, of uh, for a handful of teachers to keep track of at a given moment. Could we could actually mention on our next slide, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Also, uh, lacking enclosure. Um, there are many schools around the United States that are lacking a perimeter or enclosure around the, the recess area. Um, it's, uh, it's a very imperfect system. classroom average size of 21 students per, per teacher. It's by the National Center of Education Statistics. Um, typical recess period consists of multiple uh, classes, means there's too many students to, to watch over. Um, yeah. You couple that obviously with the children who have an inherent 
uh, lack of risk assessment and risk judgment, a couple of those two things together, and obviously, you know, a child who's out of sight of a teacher or lunch at any given moment can run off, can run off the uh, recess area, run away from the playground without realizing the situation or the danger that they could be putting themselves into. Here's an example. This is a uh, Thorndike Elementary School. Uh, you can clearly see there's no there's no perimeter, there's no enclosing, there's houses behind there. A child could easily be abducted. Um, you know, for more sinister motives, it's a, it's a problem. And this is just one example of a school that we happen to find in Washington. I'm sure if anyone <coughs> here in the audience were to reflect on elementary schools in your local areas. You know, I'm sure you can all think about areas where, you know, the recess fields are wide open, they're not properly fenced in, you know, there's no way to really keep kids in the play area uh, the way that would be ideal. So. So Here is a statistic by the missing and exploited children. This is, um, this is an, over, an overall number of situations, it's not specific towards young children in playgrounds, but that's factored into this to this report. Um, there's almost 800,000 children that are reporting missing each year. More than 2,000 of these are abducted by family members. And uh, 58,000 are from non-family abductions. Luckily, the reason for the discrepancy in those numbers is just because of those 800,000 reported um, abductions, you know, thankfully, most of them are. Um, what is the, the child could be street over. Um, yeah. You know, at a friend's house and the parent is most aware. Them, yeah, most of them are not serious there's, there's reports. A lot of false, false reports. Um, about 115, 115 reported abductions presented cases where strangers uh, abduct and kill children, uh, hold them for ransom, or take them with the intentions to keep. It's actually cited from the Center of Missing Exploited Children. Uh, 115 is far too many. Despite the minuscule percentage of the total number, that's, we feel it should never even reach that number to begin with. So. I, have, I have another statistic. This is a, it's a key statistic for, for why we, we implemented this device. Um, and this is, just comes from Chicago. Um, it's a newspaper article from the Chicago Tribune. It's reported by David Jackson and Greg Marks. According to the newspaper, uh, uh, by the Chicago Tribune, this was on December 17, 2010, pretty recent. It states more than three quarters of the 407 alleged strangers, uh, stranger abductions attempt, uh, attempts were in Chicago since 2008. Um, they took place a thousand feet from school, and five percent of the 407 uh, occurred actually on school grounds during during recess. It's, it's 20 children. It's, it's a piece of the pie that we're trying to get rid of. So um, naturally, as we're going through and developing this um, this device, we considered Amber Alerts and how they're implemented, what their what their effects are. As you can see here, I mean, this uh, summary of the Amber Alert guidelines was pulled straight from the uh, Department of Defense's website. Um, and in order for an Amber Alert to even be issued in the first place, it needs to meet, the situation has to meet all of these criteria. You know, a reasonable belief by the law enforcement that abduction has occurred. The law enforcement agency believes that the child is in imminent danger of serious bodily injury or death. Um, there needs to be enough descriptive information about the victim just to be able to issue the Amber Alert to begin with. Um, obviously a child under 17 years of age, and that's clearly the demographic that we're marketing this wristband to. It's mostly towards elementary school children. Um, and obviously all of their information that needs to be gathered from step three has to then be entered into a system. Uh, while the Amber Alert system is phenomenal, and it has helped save you know, hundreds of lives over the years since its implementation, um, it still takes time. It requires time to implement. And obviously when a child goes missing, when the bug, when an, abduction is suspected, time is of the essence. So this next slide actually shows that. As of February 2017, 868 children have been rescued due to the Amber Alert system. 
And this graph actually shows a statistic for the calendar year of 2015. Um, what it shows is the time that has passed between when a child is reported missing and when the Amber Alert is actually activated. As you can see here, a majority of it occurs within one to three hours um, from the child being missing to the report being <coughs> issued. And most, the whole majority across the graph is between one to six hours of issuance. And um, it's clear that, you know, you can see the uh, time shifting here that between when they're reported missing and they're actually recovered, there's a span of about one to 12 hours where the majority of those lie. Again, while the AMBER system has been very effective, it's been very helpful over the years, it's imperfect and it still requires time. And again, I will reiterate because it's so important, when a child is suspected to go missing, time is extremely important. And ideally, with our system, it should never have to actually come to this in the first place. Okay, so some possible solutions. Um, you know, you can teach proper play playground safety. Uh, it's a good tactic. It should always be advised by teachers, by family members. Um, but it's, it's an old style thing, uh, especially with uh, how technology is growing nowadays. Um, uh, also, having a fence, a fence around the perimeter, around the, the uh, recess area. Um, um, having a, even having that isn't enough. Uh, having a, a plan B isn't, isn't being overly cautious or assuming that plan A might, may not work. Um, as you can see, just implement fencing around every schoolyard and recess area in the country. It's, uh, while that would be very practical, um, it's not exactly realistic or feasible, and that would still require time to actually implement across the board. <coughs> so, basically what we determined would probably be the best solution in this instance would be to create a wearable tracking device for all the children on the playground. Um, it's a modern solution to an age-old problem. It would be easy to implement, you know, sending out bulk packages to schools. And ideally the final version of the product, you know, the culmination of our vision, would be the ability to track anyone who gets who is abducted or who leaves the uh, monitoring area. So these are essentially all of the functions that we would love to implement in, a, uh, in our tracking device. These are all the functions we had considered we would want to implement. Um, obviously, the, the technology already exists in spades for this kind of thing. And you're talking about Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, you know, RF technology. It's readily available, it's easy to access, and it's easy to use. Um, ideally, we would love to you know, establish an electronic perimeter of some kind to be able to constrict the movements of the kids to a specific area. Um, it would allow teachers to solve that problem that we addressed earlier, where they can keep track of the enormous numbers of kids um, under their responsibility, even though they may be out of sight. Um, and also, should the emergency arise, a worst case scenario where a child is abducted or possibly in danger, they will have a button of their own where they can trigger the emergency alert that would alert whoever's monitoring the receiver system that there is a situation developing. So with that in mind, we would like to uh, demonstrate very quickly for you just the uh, proof of concept that we have here. Christian, can you help me out? Yeah. As you can see, we, uh, we did try to develop a small enclosure here. It's very uh, child chic, colorful. the light basically stays green. That breadboard is supposed to represent the receiver module that our teachers would be holding in their hands or would have nearby that would alert them of whoever's leaving. Now you go ahead and click the button to cut right. off the signal. I'm gonna push that button, the signal goes red. And that's obviously to indicate that a child has either left the uh, boundary that was allotted to them or you know they've been abducted. And on the receiver end, we would like to have an alarm 
system sitting there so that obviously anyone who isn't staring at it at that moment would be able to hear that something is going on. Obviously, just another demo. As soon as you hit the button, it triggers it. <laughs> All right, um, so we have uh, different ways of how to implement a wearable tracking device. For uh, GPS, this will allow us to track the device at all times, in real time. Wireless Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, this will allow us to interface uh, with a smartphone using uh, applications. And ultimately, uh, radio frequency RF, that's the one we're using. Uh, the reason why we use that is because we get in a uh, better range. Uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, you don't get that much range with that, so that's why we chose radio frequency. So this method will give us the best short range solution. The modules we're using is a uh, 434 megahertz R modules. The uh, transmitter is the uh, wristwatch, and the receiver will be the monitor. So uh, the primary platform to build off of was an important factor. So we were deciding between a uh, microcontroller or, uh, or a digital encoder decoder. We ended up choosing the uh, Arduino, the microcontroller. The reason why we did that is because uh, it's easier to uh, be easier to add uh, functionality to the device, to the product later down the line, rather than having to redesign entirely around a digital encoder or decoder. And of importance also, one of the reasons we decided on the 434 megahertz module was because in the spectrum of radio frequencies, lower, ten lower frequencies tend to permeate materials a little bit better and they tend to travel around materials a little bit better as well. So we thought, you know, it's a perfect balance there where it could potentially travel across a school building where a recess area might be, you know, all around the building um, and you would still be able to get signal. And also, 434 megahertz modules are extremely common. They're readily available and for that reason, they're extremely cheap, which is one of our goals in designing this product was to make something that we could produce um, in bulk and market to entire schools or classrooms. As we mentioned before, the microcontroller platform would ensure more flexibility during prototyping and further iterations. Um. All right, so we had to obviously upload code into uh, the receiver and transmitter. Um, we have LEDs. The green LEDs will show us that we get signal. Red will be no signal whatsoever. And like we showed before, once you hit that button, you'll cut off the signal and you shoot a uh, red LED will go off as long as the buzzer is set for And we did code it so that it's constantly transmitting signal. Um, the only reason for the beeping that you heard was due to the loop in the code. We weren't able to eliminate that in uh, initial testing. Um, so it unfortunately comes through as the red light beeping and the, uh, or I'm sorry, as the red light flashing and the buzzer beeping. But yeah, we did wire it up so that it's constantly transmitting as desired. This is the basic schematic demo. <coughs> you can go over that if he was ever a head product engineer. Just a quick you know, overview. How we got the, the receiver right here. Here we have the Arduino. We got data going from pin 12 into the receiver, which will tell the Arduino will tell the, uh, the receiver to start listening. Uh, frequency. We got the buzzer hooked up, and we got the LED green, the sorry, the green LEDs slots, and the uh, red LED that shows no signal. Here we have the transmitter, which is pretty simple. We just have the uh, switch and the uh, transmitter itself, giving the giving uh, the data into the transmitter. Just implementation obviously required two different microcontrollers on each end of the system. So initially when we tested, we were actually 
unsure if our radio modules worked because we didn't seem to get any signal across a matter of a few inches. And then we realized we had to attach an antenna to it. It literally could not transmit beyond the span of a few inches. And once we did that, as you can see in that <coughs> image, you know, Christian was able to test and trigger it from across the room from several, several yards away. Um, and then we actually had the, well, Christian actually had the idea of, well, of attaching a, an antenna to the transmitter is increasing our distance so much. Why don't we attach it to the receiver as well and see how far we can get? So we did that. And uh, fortunately, the day we happened to test, it was uh, very foggy out, so it might be a little difficult to see. But we were able to increase the range from, like I said, a few inches across the desktop to a couple yards away and to several hundred feet. Right in that circle, again, difficult to see. That was actually Joe and I standing down the hill there. Um, so yeah, we were able to transmit for several hundred feet before a loss of signal. Obviously, demonstrating that in here would be a bit impractical. So we opted to simply cut the signal as um, part of the implementation would be. All right, so the size was an important factor to make the uh, device portable and ultimately wearable. So we decided to uh, switch the uh, Arduino Uno microcontroller to the uh, Pro Mini, which is a lot smaller in size to the uh, Yeah, as you can see there, the benefits of the Pro Mini. Um, it's extremely compact. It carries all the same programmability as an Arduino-based Uno. Um, it's lightweight, and ideally we could move the platform from a 5-volt power supply to 3.3-volt power supply, which would be ideal for a portable application like a wristband that we're um, suggesting here. It's just a simple size comparison from the initial boards used compared to the Pro Mini. It's obviously substantially smaller. Um, and then that's just another size comparison of the actual circuits that we tested with initially to the final circuit that's sitting in front of you, just not including the uh, breadboard on there. Um, again, it's noticeably smaller, noticeably more compact, lightweight, much more easy to uh, manage. Uh, simple bill of materials for us. Uh, what we found actually was that due to the availability of all the parts of the RF modules and the uh, microcontrollers, it was actually fairly cheap to produce. Um, between the transmitter and receiver portion of the circuit alone, the total cost was about $12. So when you factor out the receiver portion, you're looking at about six, seven dollars per uh, transmitter portion which we feel is ideal for mass marketing to schools. Because um, as we did do research for this product, we did find many similar products, but they're all very consumer-based. They're all meant to be sold on an individual basis. So we realized there's a niche in the market for us where we can mass market to schools and make it cheap enough so that it's a practical idea for you know schools to pass out to their kids during recess. So obviously, as you saw during the demonstration, the product does work. And as I mentioned earlier, it would be impractical to demonstrate the, the full range of the circuit um, within the confines of this hall because we were able to get several hundred feet away. Um, but it does trigger an alert warning that would you know, draw attention from the person monitoring all the children to the situation developing. And as stated earlier in the slide, time is of the essence, so the quicker um, you can draw attention to the issue at hand, the better it is. <coughs> All right, so there's something we would like to add on in the future. We would like, we would like to get just the uh, range. Just depending on where you're at, you might be in a small room, big playground, so we, we want to be able to adjust that. We consider implementing a comparator circuit, which we had actually learned about that key. Professor Balagi in our industrial electronics class. Um, it would have been nice to use that to adjust the uh, overall radius um, for the transmitter, or the allotted radius for the transmitter, basically saying that a lower power range um, from the receiver would kind of tow in the transmitter circuit, so it would minimize the, uh, the range of the transmitter. Um, obviously, we'd like to implement multiplexing later on down the line, which would allow us to actually you know have many transmitters communicating with a single receiving circuit um, which is lacking in this prototype unfortunately 
GPS tracking, like I said before, we want to be able to track the uh, device whenever it goes out of bounds at all times, in real time. Geofencing, you want to go over the geofencing? Sure, so initially, as you can see, our prototype was RF based, but we would like to eventually move into a GPS based system because we do think that would be superior. Um, ideally, we would like someone monitoring all the children to be able to be able to see all of the kids in real time or worst case scenario if they are abducted off the playground you'd be able to continue to tracking to track their motions um, and the geofencing really plays into that uh, what geofencing is a modern equivalent to just kind of drawing with your finger on a map a given perimeter specified to you know some kind of an irregular shape which is that would be very fitting for most playground areas around the country and around the world and by implementing that, you know, you would be able to specify to a finer degree the uh, the area in which the children are confined to. Also, 911 direct alerts. Uh, so, uh, like I said before, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, that will let us to uh, interface with phones. So, uh, be able to uh, make alerts right away, call 911 or whatnot. And also the tamper persistent wristband uh, in case the kid or whoever wants to they cut the bracelet, it will also send a signal to the receiver giving an alert. And that's about it. As we're saying here, we'd like to thank everyone in the electronics engineering department, of course, who helped us reach this point. You know, some special shout outs to the MET people who helped us print our uh, enclosure. Um, Professors who taught us in computer programming, which has obviously helped us step along the way, and in programming the Arduinos as necessary. Um, and yeah, I'd also like to thank obviously the entire administration at CCM. Uh, far too many names to be able to list here anymore. So, thank you. Before you start the Q and A, I just want to commend all of the teams, particularly BHT. It takes a lot of courage and nerves to be up here to talk, to explain away your 15, 16 weeks worth of work. So hats off to everybody again. Good job, good job. All right. Before we entertain the first question, I'm gonna ask BHD, um, is there a way to demo the wristwatch a little bit further than what we have right now? Um, yeah, absolutely, as I said, we, um, we just constrained the demo to something a little more practical within this uh, short range, especially given the hall, you know, from end to end, clear, long lines of sight. You know, we could go basically to the main lobby of the library out to this wall, and it wouldn't trigger yet because we're still within its uh, range. Okay. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we took the demo outside and went, you know, full out, we could certainly demo the uh, triggering for the alarm. That'll be impressive. Thank you, Randall. I've got two questions. Um, is there a way that you can, like, have the wristwatch like display what child is like missing like in, in terms of the database so we can avoid having to round up all the kids in the recess playroom and find out who's missing? Oh uh, well it's it's also <clears throat> something we want to implement in the future, having each teacher have a little display screen on, on their watch. Uh, that if a child does go outside of the, the recess area or zone, it'll send a ping back to the teacher showing them exactly what student, like a little bio on, on the student's uh, picture, how much they weigh, how, how tall they are, so they know exactly who, who to look for. And then my second question is, is that um, in terms of parents who potentially would be opposed to their children wearing this for um, fear of their safety, and, and, and like, like personal security and stuff in school, what would you do to get around like helicopter parents who are opposed to your product or by any means? Actually, not a, we actually didn't think about that, um, honestly, because we, the way we see this product is that, you know, especially for someone like a helicopter parent who is extremely, um, you know, who is extremely invested in their child's safety and well-being, um, we would like to imagine that they would be fully on board with something like this. Um, it wouldn't be a constant system where the children, you know, take it with them to and from school all the time, but it would be a way to ensure that any time during the recess hours or any time children are playing outside, um, it would be effectively you know, given to the kids. They would hang on to it during school hours, um, and then they would leave it at school you know, once leaving. 
because otherwise it would be a far more difficult um, system to implement without having you know units getting lost, units getting damaged, things like that. So. Um, Investor Phil. Sorry, you repeat that. I just didn't hear. What would, take, what would prevent the abductor from taking an object off of the child? Um, we have considered that option. We haven't reached any substantial solutions to that, but it is a constant thought of ours, which is why, as we mentioned on the uh, final slide there, we would like to implement tamper-resistant wristbands. Um, that would obviously ensure that children don't try to, you know, take it off when they're not supposed to, so that, you know, we know that they're in good standing. You know, we wouldn't want to lose track of them just because they don't want to be loose or lost track of, as we mentioned, um, kids don't always have the best sense of uh, judgment or risk assessment. So, you know, ensuring the tamper resistant wristband would make sure that they wouldn't take it off. And then, you know, just going back to what you said, it would also let us know that, hey, it's been tampered with, it's been, you know, um, taken out of the boundaries and it's been released. So what would happen if we can't just like start playing the class? Um, we wouldn't anticipate it going off. It would be, um, privy to such kind of abuse. You know, it's not meant to incorporate necessarily like an accelerometer or anything like that that could trigger it just from playing. The idea is there would be some kind of a conductive material throughout the wristband that would, um, it would trigger when the wristband is closed and if the wristband is opened, it would, you know, if it's, um, I shouldn't say open, but if it's severed without opening it, then it would set off an alarm, so. Yep. I have a question. A question. Um, Engineer Christian mentioned the, the bit of materials, right? And you also mentioned the scalability of the product so that it can be distributed by the school itself. Can you speak a little bit about that, you know, go to administration? How would you approach the sale of, let's say, 50 of these so that you can protect your, 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 your system, your, your school? Speak a little bit to that bulk, bulk type of sale, the bulk type of commissioning of the wristwatch. Joe can speak to that. He was our head of I think that's a distinct advantage, I think. Because it's inexpensive and you yeah, it's distribute it to all the kids. And Joe, are you going to Joe? Yeah, it's pretty cheap. Like uh, we said, it's $12. And I feel like if the school sent home a letter saying, you know, each each parent put a little money towards this product, mm -hmm. I feel like that's a good incentive. Mm -hmm. To, to do it and to keep their child safe an extra throw an extra dollar or you know, like and it's do. reusable and hopefully reprogrammable as yeah. well with this Arduino based course. Yeah. Like you said it's only twelve dollars like what parent would invest twelve dollars for the kids safety, you know? Yeah. Right. That's additional peace of mind, especially if you put your kid in a nursery a nursery school so. All right, additional questions? Questions? Mr. Balaki? Yeah. Remember about the 911 engineering team in its early days of 911. I think at that time it was not legal for anything to automatically call 911. Has that changed from, say, the early 70s till now? Actually, wasn't yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, it did. That's like my, I got a watch. Smart watch I got now, if you click a button, you hold it, you call 911. It certainly could, but put it malfunction and keep calling 911 over and over and over again. That was the, that was why I think the municipalities made it illegal for that. It would definitely be a design consideration and further uh Well and just further that versions. may just have to be a feature that doesn't exist. Yeah. Because of the they have, and there could be there could be legal ramifications there where municipalities have we just don't want to be bothered with automatic calls because there's too many times when something malfunctions and yeah. repeatedly calls time on. So it's going to be part of your testing, right? Yeah. More funny for testing. Before we go to engineer, Jeff, Professor Berg yeah, has a two, question. Two, two points. Number, number, I'll, I'll issue actually one point. I think you're way underselling it, okay? Because I think when kids go out on a playground, they're usually out a couple classes at a time. And usually during that time, one or two of the teachers are back for their prep time. So you're down to like one teacher watching the 200. Well, well, three kids, four, you know, three to four classes worth of kids. So it's a lot more than maybe what you're thinking as far as one to 21, it's way out of that scale. scale. Um, that's one thing. Have you thought about the tracking of the actual child? Like how would you take the device and actually go find the kid? Um, well, the device, like we said, 
current implementation doesn't involve uh, GPS tracking, right. but further versions would. Um, it would just it would continue to monitor the tracking. Ideally, the way that it would you know monitor all the children on the playground in real time using the GPS. If a child were to leave the boundary, that of course automatically sends an alert to the person holding the uh, monitoring box. Um, and once they see that alert, given the GPS tracker, they can. There's a lot more specificity there yeah, than our initial GPS, prototype yeah. with the RF. Uh, but absent the GPS, like have you a hot cold button that says when you get closer, get further, or you know? Yeah. We actually hadn't considered that, but that's uh, that is a great idea. And yeah, the transmission signal that. itself. Yeah, that, that, yeah, the frequency of the transmission signal. Yeah. Can, we can find, yeah. especially if it's out in the woods. Yeah. That's, that might be the yeah. only signal. But if it's out in the city. That's how my wife finds her keys at school. Yeah. <laughs> She's got this thing on it. And when you walk around the school, it's a hot cold one. That's right. It's just the wave, the frequency, high frequency. Question, next question. Noah. Uh, do you have any plans to market this beyond just for children at schools? Like, I know that I have an indoor cat, and if you ever got outside, I'd be really concerned that he wouldn't be able to defend himself. Yeah, we are actually buying it for pets and also for uh, older people. Sometimes uh, they forget where they're at and stuff like that. They probably just walk off, so they might want to wear one and keep track of where they're at at all times. Same with the, with the pets. I have a dog. I want to keep track of my dog. If he runs away, you know, people will get him back. Yeah. I mean, the primary inspiration was children on playgrounds, but we did consider an alternate function could be, you know, elderly citizens in homes, you know, oftentimes Alzheimer's dementia sets in and you don't necessarily know where you're going. So instead of a teacher holding a monitoring box, it's an orderly of some kind or a helper. And exact same functionality, exact same concept, just, you know, different environment. And of course we could, you know, it could be implemented for, um, for pets. Um, but as we did mention earlier, I think I brought it up, um, during the course of our research for this, we did find many similar devices that are, um, more specific, they are more expensive, and they are meant more for a you know personal consumer base. You know, a mother buying it for her child whenever they go out to the playground, and we realized, well, that exists already. So how can we, you know, put a spin on it to make our own and find a niche where it fits in? And that's how we found. That's how we figured that out. We would just you know minimize the cost, you know, still make it as um, as practical and effective as we can, and by minimizing it to make it as cheap as possible but still functional. You know, obviously we want to try to market it on um, mass. So it could be used for pets, but that wasn't the initial intention. Because like I said, we just we want to get it to you know bulk sales. Any other questions? Okay. Tom, and do your Tom. And you thought about integrating it into like the current small watches? Into an app sort of thing? Because they all have GPS nowadays. It's like no one wants to do. <coughs> and they'll have Bluetooth and that kind of thing. And you thought of making like an app that goes along with it? Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that would be for affluent, affluent kids with smart watches. I mean, well, see, yeah, a lot of people are getting them now. No, it is extremely common. Um, we had considered initially in designs, I remember Joe and I had spoken about it, about whether we wanted to try to do something that would interface directly with you know, a teacher's cell phone where they can do that. Um, and obviously the technology already exists. Or if we wanted to kind of ship out um, our monitor units with each, you know, bulk purchase. And obviously, you know, more kids come to the school, you know, you can program, you know, any set of wristbands or transmitters to a given receiver module. Um, what we actually realized during our research was, and reading reviews of various trackers was, some parents are actually turned off by the technology and by the, you know, configuration of a new device on, you know, your cell phone or application. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with someone who is just kind of scared of change, who doesn't like having to, you know, implement new technology on the phone, doesn't want to have to bother with calibrating a new functionality. So um, after we realized that, we thought, you know, maybe it would be a better idea if we just, you know, marketed it as something that comes with its own device so that there's no calibration necessary. Basically works out of the box, essentially. Um, and that would attract people who, like I said, are a little more technologically deficient or afraid. Questions. I have one final question. Sure. Have you explored international opportunities, <coughs> countries with no Amber Alert, no 911 system? Because I think this might be a fantastic opportunity in those emerging countries. 
Uh, we didn't consider it, but you know, of course, it, it, absolutely. I mean, recess areas, you know, school playgrounds. They're you know, they're not constrained to only the United States. You know, they exist everywhere. So, of course, it can be implemented. You know, worldwide to whoever would choose to buy it. Any other questions with our final group? Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Introducing Bandit Corporation and the Stringer Project. Take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. We are a family, a subsidiary of Cortano Industries. And <coughs> our team, me, Engineer Derek, with Engineer Josh, and Engineer Danny. One of the biggest parts that I found was that people using cell phones still had uh, work, the workload effects 27, 27 seconds after using their device. 300,000 accidents happened alone from distracted drivers, killing almost 4,000 people in 2015. So when we came to the table, we thought, how can we help? solve this issue. And we thought of some things. This is one of our early sketches. We were trying to think of some early solutions. One of them is Stringer. Stringer lets municipal vehicles shoot RF signals to traffic lights, allowing traffic to flow freely letting these vehicles get to where they need to go, decreasing response time, and helping save more lives in the process, while have not, have not causing access at intersections. We thought of this because we throw more firefighters and law enforcement, law enforcement workers die due to related accidents, rather than performing their actual job or tactical duties. Nearly 537 injuries and 62 deaths in 1990. In 2017, the US population was 326 million compared to 249 million in 1990. With more people on the road, this is more dangerous. With more drivers and more chances for people to get to get taxes. In New York City, there are are many traffic lights. And this is one of the great applications for this. Letting municipal vehicles get to their get to their, their location and these busy intersections like cities. The benefits of Stringer, like I said, safer intersections when turning for emergency vehicles a quicker response time and transfer time for these vehicles, and increased public safety. We have a, a little full light diagram here with a, we have a power source, the switch that activates the transmitter that, that goes to the receiver and the Arduino. This we, we turn interrupt the traffic light and change it to green when you, you need to when you need a green light. One of the things we, we knew we had to fix was we couldn't, we can't have multiple lights turning at the same time. To, to fix this, we decided to, do, to designate a north, south, east, and west traffic light bit address. So you shoot a bit, and that bit address only affects one of the, the, the traffic lights. 
to ensure that no two waves can appear at the same time, causing more accidents. But in full scale, we realize that a programmable integrated circuit will be cheaper to, to implement and more, more uh, attractive in the long run. In some fuel testing we did, we found that the range was 1,000 feet max, but traveling at about 25 miles per hour, about 350 feet. This is only a limited testing, so further testing would need to happen. We also found that the receiver, when drawn, when was drawn when resting was about 500, 5.15 milliamps, and when and when receiving was the same. Transmitting, the transmitter was uh, drawing about 340 microamps when transmitting, and no draw when not transmitting at all. So this is very good for battery life on um, in cars and for the receiver and the uh, and traffic lights. We have a little cost analysis here with the, some of the parts we use. And it, it's going to cost around 1840 for the, both the receiver and transmitter. But we know that using the pick, we can bring these costs down even more and make this idea even more attractive to uh, people. To implement this, we, we want to work with the government and put this in school zones, municipal vehicles, <coughs> railroads, construction zones that are the working hours, and accident-prone areas to decrease accidents on the road. <coughs> All right, the other thing we have is a car dash cluster. So we want to make sure when the signal's going off on your dash system, there's a warning light going off. So this is what we designed. It's a warning signal. It'll go on your dash signal um, right when an accident happens or right when any warning's happening. That's going to go off. It's going to let you know it's a problem. Whenever there's a transmission and you're in that radius, that dash, dash card cluster is going off. And as soon as you get out of that radius, it will turn off. All right, benefits of our car dash cluster. So like we said, our goal, we want to stop distracting <coughs> driving. It's the perfect way to do it. So it's going to create awareness and any drivers, it's going to prevent accidents from occurring. So the benefits be reduced crash fatalities, enhanced driver awareness, communication with other cars in the radius, big. Uh, increased safety in school zones, construction zones, pedestrian areas, railroads. There's a lot of accidents uh, within all those areas. So that would give the driver one step ahead of the problem. And also, it would decrease all traffic related deaths. Not all. All right, implementation. So, what we want to do, we want to make the dash cluster safety requirement in all new vehicles. So in the future, what we want to do is make sure all new cars are being manufactured with our car dash warning. So that would be it. So right here, just to replace that with that. Goes off, eliminates. Uh, another thing we want to do, we want to work with insurance companies to give customers cheaper insurance for installing no litter vehicles. So why would people want to do that? We're giving them a discount on insurance for implementing this. They're going to want to do it. They're going to feel pressure to do it. It's going to make things safer and more people will have it. It'll prevent injuries. Oops. So about the future. So what we want to influence, we want to influence this into all traffic lights. We also want to put this in common, uh, autonomous vehicles. 
So we have a vehicle to vehicle, vehicle connection. So all vehicles know where they are so they know not to hit each other. Also, to have radio directional detection. And we can, we can get a lot of all this information to help make roads safer and drivers safer. Yeah, and just something on this, our dash cluster, we eventually want to have directional. So let's say there's a warning, the cluster's going to tell you where it is. So we have arrows, you have the left, right, anywhere. It's going to let you know what's going on. Prototyping. So these are just a few pictures of how we got our product. You want to do a little demo for you guys and how this product works? So, say you have an ambulance coming at an intersection. By pressing this button here, it interrupts the traffic light, turning the screen automatically, making the sure traffic flows more freely for the rich people to pass through. Well, while that happen, while that's happening, this dashboard cluster is, turns on. It strings the green lights, and you have the dashboard. Everyone alert. knows that there is something happening in the nearby area. Just be more cautious of your driving. Wow. And it turns off when the man turns from the area. This also can apply for work trucks. If you're a work truck and have a uh, transmission going out in the, in the, work, in the, in the area of the, the working truck, your side of the road, and all that goes on. So there are any more cautions about like someone working on the side of the road, or even school buses, where school buses are picking up or dropping off kids, and they know they'd be more cautious. So like, a good prop, Josh. <laughs> to keep kids safer. Some more pictures of when we're putting our projects together. Uh, and I thank you a lot for for everyone that helped us out with this project. I've seen these many times, but I'm, I'm still fascinated. Have a seat, the bandwidth. Terrific demo, Danny, terrific demo, Derek. I can, I can already imagine possibilities here. All right, the bandwidth, let's start with client Phil. For the device, what's preventing it from falling into your average consumer's hands? Is that change the signal? What's preventing it from having multiple people just change the signal at point? Currently, our design is it. our address is only 8 bits long, but we plan on making that a lot longer. Also, we plan on changing the bit address every 24 hours to make it harder for people to get a hold of this information and use it in a negative way. Good. More questions, more questions for bandwidth. The Stringer system, it's a solution. They will negotiate with the government, they'll negotiate with car companies, insurance companies. This is like large scale. Large scale implementation. Questions, more questions. Noah. How about people? Is there any implementation for like a person who's say going jogging or something or you know, children playing outside? Have you thought about it, doing anything like that? Um, we haven't currently, but we can definitely look into something like that for pedestrians. So many of you guys are going to be using this for emergency vehicles first and foremost, but will you plan to include uh, such vehicles such as, say, funeral congregations, or will that have to be zoning laws mm -hmm. that are contracted by the city itself? We don't think we plan on doing that only because we only we don't feel like that's actually an emergency. We are too. Because, like, see, like, those things, like, they come through the intersection, right? 
and there's like almost like no warning. You can't like tell if they're like an emergency thing or not. And they're like they got no police escorts, and they, they just come right through the lights. Like when at a lake or you know, that happens. Let me just say something on it. So all you really need would be just. They have to transmit the signal. So let's say you want to do that, just put a transmitter through, it's gonna send that warning light. It's the same thing. And before we take the next question, I'm just another comment, right? I think your value proposition is extremely strong, especially because of deaths, right? I mean, how many times have you seen, you know, a cop car or an ambulance kind of just zoom through, hoping that someone will pull, pull to the side, but they do not. So that alone can get investment. And I think we can ask them more questions about feasibility technology. Like for me, I have lots of technology questions for you guys. Your demo is fantastic, but how, it, how will it coexist with the existing traffic system? And so you're gonna have to answer that question. I say the demo, the idea of it, fantastic. How do you plan to have it coexist with any existing system, the traffic light system, um, the, the, the radio between ambulances and cop cars. Derek, Danny, Josh. We would have to talk to governments and get them to on the same page with us and have be able to implement this in the traffic lights and have someone be able to watch, watch over so no one is misusing this, this technology. That's a big concern for us. And we also want to be able to implement a system where emergency vehicles will get a response back. If they were to show transmission off, they'd be like, okay, up ahead, now I'm, I'm good to go. So they, they will know that they're, they're, they're good to go in the, the traffic lights head. Because there is a system, and I'm sure if they open up that system to you guys, because the idea behind this, I think, is fact that no one has done it yet, right? A string of green lights so that you know yourself you can go, or a string of red lights so you yourself know that you, you can't go. Right. Question from the audience? Did you talk? So I know on one of the slides you had like distracted driving and that you're saying it's a problem, but the way you pitch this makes it seem like this is just for like emergency vehicles when they need to go through a light. I want to just know how your product helps with distracted driving in general. Because that's one of the slides and I, mm -hmm. I don't think I would put this under distracted driving. When you're driving a car and a new light pops up in your dashboard, don't you instantly see that new light and face it's attention? Well, I mean, yeah, you notice it, but you're saying like texting and driving and stuff like that. If you are texting, when you're, like that pops up, that also distracts you from looking at the road ahead. Yeah. So that'd be taking you a longer time to look ahead. If you text and you notice the symbol light up on your dashboard, instantly your head's coming up back to your dashboard and your eyes are almost on the road again. This symbol saying, be cautious, saying, now you know it's a, I have to stop. Put what I'm doing down, keep my ass on the road, and stay alert. So then it would also help with, so then it would also help with like anywhere that is an intersection or would it only help with an intersection? Well, we only plan on having transmitters and work in municipal vehicles, uh, in the working, working vehicles, and, and uh, especially if we don't want to get the transmitter into the wrong hands. Receivers will be given to anyone that wants to receive the information. Um, Julio, client Julio. Yeah. Hey, uh, you said you put a line in the dashboard with the red lights coming. Uh, it's not better have a sound or, or something instead of visual. A sound a coming from sound, sound, sound in the car? Yeah, mm -hmm. like a red light ahead or something like that, like in the radio or something else. Mm -hmm. That would be easier because somebody distracted uh, hearing is faster than what you We were looking into the idea, but we also didn't want to scare the driver and have them panic while they're driving the vehicle. That's why having a subtle hint on your dashboard gives you everything you need to know. I need to be, be more careful now. Jersey microwaves, that's the old. Right, just a good question. Uh, I guess the follow up to what the, the engineer in the front asked. Um, it sounds like to me, right, the receiver or the light would only go off if there was a 
transmitter in the vicinity, whether mm -hmm. it's an intersection or highway or whatever, right? So pretend I was driving down Highway 80, just texting away, not paying attention. If there was no receiver nearby, I could be driving into a ditch, and I wouldn't know if I was really that distracted. Well, this device isn't going to stop you from getting into a car accident. Right. It's supposed to bring more awareness to your, your actions while in the car. Right, but that's only if there is a signal nearby to trigger that yeah. type of thing. Right? Okay. That's right. Okay. That, is, that is a limitation, but yeah. yeah. Thanks. Engineer uh, Randall? Yeah. Following up on what the side of the room was saying, like, I barely notice like when my engine light comes on in my mm -hmm. car. I only like notice it like when I'm glancing down, like at, just when I'm like trying to play with the radio or something at a red light. Wouldn't it just be like better to have like some sort of like receiver on like the upper side of the car, or, like near to mirror, where like people have like a general view of everything, and they can see like colored lights like going on and off to like know whether or not like uh, there's an accident up ahead or something. I just think that would be like better. Well, we are doing is we are making it that the icon will blink too making it more it, it'll bring your attention more easier to your dashboard so you'll be able to see i have a blinking icon i should look at this now and on the um, sound thing of it whenever like my brake lights go off i just get like a small like subtle like ringing tone it, it doesn't startle me or anything but it does bring attention to the fact that my emergency brake light went off so I just think like something like that would be like much better. Like you can implement a sound system without like completely spooking the driver. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we should look further into this. And so. Pressure Burke. Yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna challenge one of your assumptions. Okay. okay. Did you do a trade to, to look at whether you should be turning lights green or red? Because a lot of times with emergency vehicles, the best thing for them to do is to get out of the traffic that's in front of them and get on the other lane. And so if you turn all the traffic lights red, then they can get through. If you have that green, then they're still stuck in that traffic beat that they're behind. So just could do a trade on that to see which way you thought was the best way to do it? Well, that's exactly what happens. When a municipal vehicle is coming at an intersection, mm -hmm. it turns green and everything else turns red for a brief time. So they can then take a, a turn left or turn right, depending on where they're trying to get to. So you're saying they still have the option of going around the traffic in front of them? Even though the traffic wouldn't be, like, I'm coming down the road with a fire truck, right? Yeah. And I'm stuck in my traffic. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, if that light goes red, that's and all the lights go red, then no traffic's going to come at me. I can get in the opposite lane and go right through the light without having to wait for traffic in front of me, waiting for traffic on either side, still make turns left and right. And have you, I'm just saying, that's part of the thought process. You should be afraid on, see whether or not, what the right option is, what you should be doing. You should be turning red or turning green. We personally thought we should be able to turn on green so we can control when a vehicle can go. I, I understand you know, what you're saying, yeah. I'm just yeah. saying there's, there, may be, there may be some counter thought to it. Yeah, I think there's, there's more life experience. Because yes. I think they're going to negotiate with car companies also. With, with, with like a car dashboard, <clears throat> yeah, it could go yeah. either way, right? All depends on whether. And, but, but here's the thing as well, right? Not everybody's going to have a brand new car dashboard. Brand new car also. That's why we offered the, the talk, we want to talk with insurance companies so they can yes. offer low insurance rates for people to incentivize them to have an like annual car dashboard alert, right? Yeah. yeah. Engineer Steve. Okay, I just have two points. First of all, the preview I thought what Professor Berg said, um, in conjunction with this point, uh, do you have any idea on how you prepare to compete with uh, normal state and federal uh, legislation regarding uh, stopping? when emergency vehicles are within proximity. Um, because the whole premise of seeing and uh, coming close with the emergency vehicle is to have as many drivers stop and move out of the path um, as, as soon as possible and in any way shape possible. Because as an emergency vehicle driver, the last thing you need to do is deal with drivers that are A, driving and B, moving. Um, it's much easier to deal with vehicles that are stopped. So is that something that went into your thought process? Uh, in, Coming going with the green light idea? We actually thought that was a, that would be a negative effect because all the time I see the we, we emergency vehicles trying to they stop at an inter intersection, trying to wait until they, they can get to where you need to go to go a left turn or a right turn or go straight. Instead of having that, making the light turn green, so there is no they don't have to stop. They can just keep driving through the light or make a turn on the right if they need to. Okay. And my second point is um, 
when it comes to the uh, the car dash cluster, um, the uh, standard analog and uh, individual light based uh, readout is becoming something of the past. Uh, more vehicles are turning to computer based operating uh, dash clusters, uh, gauge readouts. Um, some of them don't necessarily have gauges at all in some of the modern cars. How do you um, how do you prepare to integrate your specific warning light into existing car manufacturers' uh, programming? Because in, in essence, it's going from a physical light that's uh, receiving input from a transmitter to going through the car's computer. We would definitely need to, to talk to car companies and and be able to implement this in, in their software so their cars can receive the same icon and the, and the newer models as well. Yeah, uh, lots of great questions. Engineer Noah. Uh, having driven ambulances before, one of the biggest issues that I've run into is that uh, when you're driving down the road, regardless of whether there's a stop sign or a traffic light around, people kind of lose their minds when there's a big, loud, you know, flashing vehicle behind them. And while people would, you know, should stop, pull over to the side of the road, a lot of times they don't. And it's even gotten to the point where we'd have to get on the loudspeaker and say, please pull to the side of the road. From real life uh, experience, right? Right. Yeah. So perhaps there's an opportunity for this product where the ambulance can be constantly sending out a signal to all cars nearby. And maybe like what other people were saying about having some sort of audio cue in the car. Maybe, you know, the car can start talking to the driver and say, you know, ambulance behind you, please pull to the side of the road. You know, that might be another opportunity for the system to be used not just at intersections. And the great thing, before I take the engineer first question, the great thing about your project, guys, is it makes people really think, because you're suggesting an infrastructure. Right, as opposed to a bird study. I mean, traffic study, maybe Uber can help us out, that maybe the municipality can help us out. I mean, you guys have raised awareness about an infrastructure and possibly a revolution, but you need many of these pieces to be talking to each other, right? So, so we'll keep going. Engineer Phil, question. How would it deal with traffic like sinking issues? What do you mean by that? Like when you have two intersections nearby each other, one of them flashes off, but the other one flashes on. You can see it right out here on the uh, CCM. What? When you uh, come in off of the road next to the AMP parking lot, you speed there. Yeah. This yeah. one flashes off, while the other one is not, and then vice versa. So well, then it repeats. Well, with our product, whichever traffic light turns green. The rest all turn red. So how long does last? How long does last? It will last as long as there'll be a timer for when the, the transmission is long, no longer being received. It will go back to normal programming, and it will go back to the normal uh, coding that it was used before. Yeah, because there's 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 code. I mean, there's there's code yeah. in the traffic system that 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 this team and they have to review it. Not only that, Professor Berg, we have to review people's quote unquote actions. Their their the sentiments, right? I mean Noah just mentioned it, right? What do you do? Like for me, when there's a cop behind me or, or there's like an ambulance behind me, guess what I do? I try to speed up just to lose them. <laughs> I mean that's what I would do, right? And it's, so then it's uh, or I turn. I usually just turn. You know, and although you know I'm planning to go to the mall or something, I just find a different route. So I don't have to deal with it. That's my behavior. So there has to be more studies done, but I think that means you guys have done a great job in raising awareness that anyone wanting to do a revolution like this, an infrastructure revolution like this, there's a lot of many moving parts, but this discussion alone could get you a half a million dollars and then you just you know, hire another you know, <coughs> team member and, and so on and so forth. More questions, two more questions and we wrap up. Engineer Julio. Uh, there's a chance for the ambulance or the police force to Decide what the light, uh, what kind of light they want. They want light. What, what was that again? Uh, but uh, if a police officer wants to choose which light for first, if he wants the cars to move forward, they can have a green light with all the red, there's a chance to give the power to a police or the ambulance. Um, they would only be able to control any light that, that is in the, in the directional front view. So they won't be able to, say, control the one left, right, or opposite of them. I think Bandwidth's getting a lot of questions because we want to coexist. We want to coexist, we want to go fast, we want to 
get to places where we want to coexist with these emergency vehicles and law enforcement of uh, vehicles. Because there, there are deaths. I mean, I have to be out there. Crashes and deaths. And, um, you know, hopefully something gets to be done. But it, it, it's a lot of different moving parts, organizations. But from a technology standpoint, I think you guys are going to explore whatever it takes, right, to, to, to ascertain what the next steps are and then collect some data, do some more studies. Studies. That, I mean, even the blood you had to do what, like a twenty million dollar study about Uber versus liver. Is it Liverpool tax? What do you call it? Liver good liver. Livery tax. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any more questions? Otherwise, I'm going to ask them about the capstone question. You know, <laughs> what courses helped you get to this point? Yeah. Oh, I have a question for some. I have a question, and yeah. I also uh, served on an ambulance corps for a long time. Any time, I, and I'm just listening to all the different comments, and I can see a place like New York City where my dashboard's never going to go off because it's just going to be constantly on and telling me that something's happening. Um, but most of the time, if you have a large enough incident, you have emergency vehicles coming from all directions. So if I'm going this way and I've got another vehicle coming perpendicular, who gets priority? That's a good question. That's that we haven't really had a solution for yet. But that's part of the reality but, of things, right? That's part of the reality. How, how it would work right now is one vehicle, one direction would turn green. And as soon as it was the transmission was not being received from that traffic light, the, the, the next traffic light would say, oh, OK, I, I now it's my turn so that they could go. Theoretically, but you understand that people have reaction times when they're actually looking at traffic lights. So you go through a sequence of yellow before you get to the red because you there's stopping distances, there's reaction times, and you can't just flip things that fast. And when you have emergency vehicles, that's why they have the, the alarm hurts. That's why they have this lights and sirens. It's supposed to tell people that you have to be aware of what's coming around. Right. And I think the worst of course point that's why we need, quote unquote, education, because those system of equations, those matrices, those simulations, those algorithms, you can create a rule. That's, I think that's the key. You know, get, get, get data and, and develop a rule which takes precedence. But, but thank you for using that word. So that, that's, a, that's a reality. A reaction time of 0.16 seconds is a real thing. But of course, some people have no brake pads in their cars. That's another one. <laughs> you hear them <laughs> you hear them each and every day, just kind of like a, a side fun note there. And we have a guest, you know, uh, Jersey Microwave, they do um, satellite RF devices as well. So ultimately, hopefully we can all talk. You know, Professor Burke teaches physics 112. And again, I got to do the capstone thing, as you know. got to do the capstone thing. <laughs> Professor Burke teaches physics 112, and from all the electrical stuff, the resistors, the capacitors, all the way to the waves, yeah. all about the waves. I think the, the, the secret sauce here is electromagnetic waves and math. I think that's, that's where it's at. Didn't I? I really love the demo, guys. I really love the demo. I thought I was, I was in my car looking at the traffic lights. <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. All right. Um, before we end, I'm going to ask the entire team to come up. Protect with Grab Guard. Just come on up. We're going to just have a group picture. Protect, Grab Guard. Uh, <laughs> the, you say, okay, STI with Simbox. A big applause though for bandwidth. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. We need the feedback from you guys because ultimately we want to grow as an engineering program. All right. From engineering sample, we learn a lot of theory. We learn how to problem solve. But sometimes we lose touch about who we're solving the problems for. Even questions which didn't have concrete answers. I think those are still phenomenal. Even questions that had answers, but you know the answers were anecdotal instead of evidential. That's, that's all good. This is what we're all about. And, and hats off to these kids, to these students, because I think you're destined for great things for as long as you have discipline, keep on working hard, you make us proud, and make no mistake, you will mentor people in the future like this as well. All right, thank you so much for being in at that. Easy, 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 easy. Thank you.